Welcome to Jewish Wisdom on JTV. You know, there's a famous Jewish proverb, um, which is in Hebrew, Ein chacham keba'al nisayon, that there is no wisdom that compares to the wisdom of someone who has experienced a challenge. And seeing as this segment is called Jewish Wisdom, I cannot think of anyone more appropriate for us to have on this segment, given the, the, the proverb that I just mentioned, than Ron Leeton, who's joining us today, who is a Holocaust survivor. Um, Ron, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, can I begin by asking you just to share with us your story? Well, I happen to have been born in Poland, in a little town called Wielicka, which is next to Krakow. Wielicka is famous in the world because of the largest salt mines. We seem to have had a fairly comfortable existence, a house, behind the house, an enormous garden, slightly smaller than Regent's Park. But this was the trouble, that we were extremely happy and comfortable in Poland. I attended school. In my class of 30, there were five Jews. I did not, I repeat, I did not experience any anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, the time rolled on until we heard that the war was about to start. We started escaping by using a horse-drawn wagon, which unfortunately was confiscated by the army. We continued, but the German army caught up with us. We started going back and we stopped in a small town in a flat which belonged to some friends of my family. And unfortunately we saw that the synagogue, more or less next to the flat, was set alight by the Germans. We continued on our way back to Vielichka, although some of the people who were with proceeded eastwards, which in a way was a right decision, because eastward was going into the Soviet zone. But uh, my family decided to go back home. By the time we arrived in Vilishka, our maid, who was extremely important to us, told us that when the Germans entered, immediately they killed 32 Jewish men. We somehow continued to exist because we lived of whatever we can, we could get from the garden, or somehow we continued, and everything went on more or less in order until 1942. In 1942, they started sending transports of Jews to the East, supposedly to work. Unfortunately, my mother was one of the people to be sent out. The transports went to Belgets. What hurts me in a way, we hear about Auschwitz, Treblinka, but there's very little heard about Belgets. It's a place where half a million people were murdered. They were not just Jews, they were gypsies, they were German uh, communists, people of different qualities which were not comfortable to the Germans. 
we uh, existed in, in Vilitska. My mother was, as I said, taken. My father and I found our way to Krakow, which by that time was a Krakow ghetto. We were staying in a flat belonging to a cousin of my mother's, and it was quite comfortable. He was a, a doctor, a skin specialist, and somehow he was friendly with the man who more or less was in charge of the ghetto, an assessment called Kunde. And Kunde used to come every few days for a drink, for a chat. Once he found me asleep on the floor of the kitchen, and he asked me, was machst du denn? What are you doing here? And I said that I happened to be working in Kabelwerke in a night shift, and therefore I was asleep during the day. He said, hab keine Angst, it means don't be afraid. And he left me some sweets. And so it went on. The situation was getting worse. And next to us in the ghetto was a lady called Dr. Rosalia Blau, who was a very good-looking woman, who had a fiancé, non-Jewish man, who tried to convince her to leave with him to the Polish side. But she refused because she was in charge of the Kinderheim, of the children. She simply refused. And once he brought a man who was more able to talk, to try to convince her. He is now known as Karol Wojtyla, who became, after the war, the Pope. We existed in, in the ghetto, and then we were taken to a transport, which we didn't know, but went first to Auschwitz for supposedly selection. We didn't quite know, we were in the wagons, we didn't quite know, but on the opposite side, we saw a huge transport of Hungarians. Therefore, we were not undergoing selection. And the train went further on to Mauthausen. Now, Mauthausen was an old concentration camp in existence from well before the war. It didn't just have Jews, it just have had people. My father and I managed to be assigned to work. It was difficult, but we did work. My father, towards the end of December, became ill, had a cold, subsequently developed into pneumonia, and I visited him in a so-called Krankenzimmer, means uh, sick room. Suddenly he said, it's Hanukkah. To me it was a nest, a miracle. 
I didn't know whether it was Monday, or whether it was December, and he knew that it was Hanukkah. And after he said that, he died. In the camp, there was a cousin of my father's named Reisman. He organized for me to say Kaddish. And I was able to say Kaddish. Did you have to do that secretly? Well, somehow I managed to say Kaddish. Right. Which meant a lot to me. Of course, it still means a lot to me now. By the way, I wish to highlight that my father's family were very orthodox. The relative was Kirschbaum, who was the chairman of the Jewish community in Germany, in Frankfurt. The existence in the camp to say it was terrible is a polite understatement. But somehow, I was in good books of a man who was Lagerschreiber, which means secretary. Once I remember that I repaired his trousers. Since then, I received an additional plate of soup a piece of bread, and somehow that's how I managed to survive or to go from day to day until the camp was evacuated because the factory where we worked, Nebelungenwerker was bombed. And we were, the, during the bombing, we were in underground cellars and nothing happened to us. But four or five days later, the Allied planes came back and bombed again. It was not possible to work there anymore. So they more or less liquidated the camp and sent us to another camp called Ebenze. Ebenze was an awful camp. In a place where one person was supposed to sleep, they shoved two or three people. And it, it was terrible. And again, what hurts me, once or twice I was able to get some bread. Some Hungarian Jews managed to snatch it away from me. You see, the Hungarians were late comers to the concentration camp, so they had more car. However, I somehow survived Ebenze until the end of the war. I was in an awful state, but I survived. American troops came in with their tanks, and I was a young boy. An American woman, medical officer, took me away and put me in a room, locked the room, and kept visiting me every half an hour or so. I had water, and that's all for about two days. The reason was that some of the survivors got hold of tins of meat, tins of whatever it is, and were simply dying from eating. 
I survived and I stayed in a place where there were about six, eight, ten other survivors in an old church. And once one of the men called me over and he said, will you do me a favor? I said, well, of course, if I can. He said, when I die, will you say Kaddish? I cried and I hugged him and I said, look, keep up, keep up the morale. I'm left alone. I need you, please keep up the morale. Unfortunately, he did die. And I did say Kaddish. There was another case. There was a Polish boy, non-Jewish, at that time, and we played cards, domino, given by the American forces. And suddenly a doctor came and said, I have to give you an injection. Well, if a doctor wants an injection, it's fine. I was given an injection. I woke up more than two days later. I didn't know what happened. But there was a nurse, a Polish nurse, non Jewish nurse. She explained to me that unfortunately, this colleague of mine, this friend, was about to die, and they wanted me to be away, not to be aware of another tragedy. And that's how I arrived at the end of the war. The American troops were very very nice. They were shocked by the state that they found, that they came to. They really couldn't quite cope, but that was the reality. Wow, that's some story. Um, you know, uh, we don't really have much time to go into the, the depth and details of your story. But given the nature of this, uh, this segment, it's called Jewish Wisdom, um, I wanted to ask you, given all your experiences, all the challenges you've been through, what would you say are the most important principles to live by in life? The most important is, is try to leave the past where it belongs and try to look up. I tell you one situation. We were in the barracks, because obviously we were on a night shift, and they told us to get out of the barracks and because they were cleaning the barracks, and we were standing a group of four or five huddled together. We didn't communicate because there was one Norwegian, one Yugoslav, one German. So we just stood there. And I looked up and I saw a gorgeous view of snow-covered mountains. Below, beautiful snow-covered forest. And I realized this is the truth. This is the beauty of nature. What we're finding ourselves just happens to be unfortunate. But my occasional return to positivity was something which helped me to survive, to stick to the positivity. 